In the past 400 years, our understanding of reality has taken giant leaps. These leaps have come from the courage to challenge our beliefs, no matter how deeply entrenched. Spirituality is undergoing a similar revolution. Although most people's beliefs are still rooted in outmoded ways of thinking, a significant number of us want a better model of spirituality, one aligned with science and evidence, rather than with dogma. It is time to transform spirituality into an evolving discipline, similar to science. In science, old models are constantly being discarded in favor of better ones. If spirituality becomes an evolving discipline, it will serve as a foundation to create harmony and peace for individuals, as well as the planet. This video explores evidence-based spirituality. It is divided into three parts, principles, practices, and tools. Let's begin with principles. A model of spirituality has to answer three fundamental questions. Who are we? Where do we come from? And why are we here? Fortunately, there is more than 50 years of research to help us answer the questions. The first piece of the puzzle comes from the research on reincarnation at the University of Virginia. This work has been pioneered by Dr. Ian Stevenson and Dr. Jim Tucker. Let's look at a case study. At the University of Virginia, a group of psychiatrists use science to unlock the secrets of reincarnation. Since the 1960s, the Division of Perceptual Studies has been collecting cases of children who claim past life memories. They now have files on 2,500 children. Well, I think what the research shows is that for people who are open to considering the possibility that there is evidence that consciousness at times can exist separately from a functioning brain. So in the cases of these children's reports, if you look at the, the best cases, uh, they provide evidence that at times there can be this carryover of memories and emotions that seem carried over from one life and, and continue on in another. I play sports, baseball, soccer, go to Ascension Episcopal School. I have a lot of friends there. The other kids, when they were younger, say, I want to be a fireman. I want to be an astronaut. But I was always, I want to be a fighter pilot. I want to be in the Marines. Oh, you guys are school pictures. Yeah. Oh, they came out nice. From the age of three, James's parents began to hear stories from their son that shocked them that their son was recalling things that connected him to a Navy pilot who died in 1945. They were skeptical. Bruce is an HR manager in the oil industry. Andrea is a former ballerina turned instructor. As Christians, they never believed in reincarnation, but they began to piece together an amazing story. The first clue came from the terrifying non-stop nightmares that James began having at the age of two. He was saying, airplane crash on fire, little man can't get out. Airplane crash on fire, little man can't get out. That's when I was like, oh my God, is that what he's been dreaming this entire time? What he was saying wasn't registering as much on me and what he, as what he was doing. He was flailing around in bed. And I remember the very specific thought I had at that point. This looks like the exorcist. He was <laughs> freaking out. I had this thought, he possessed. What is going on here? Within a year, the visions that greeted James in his nightmares began taking shape when he was wide awake. I was reading to James, and then he sat up and he goes, Mama, the little man's going like this. And he laid down. And he goes, and he did the same thing he did in his dream. He's kicking his feet up and he goes, little man's going like this. Ooh, 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 can't get out, can't get out. And he, I sat him back up and I said, who's the little man? And he goes, me. It still makes my hair stand up. And Bruce said, what happened to your plane? And he said, it crashed on fire. And he said, why did your airplane crash? And he said, it got shot. And Bruce said, who shot your plane? And he went, Ugh. 
The Japanese! James then gave his parents the next uncanny clue, one that was very specific. The name of a ship from which he says his aircraft took off. So I said, well, did your boat have a name? And he said, uh, Natoma. And I, I'd never heard the word before. And I went down the hall and uh, got onto the computer and Googled it. And down around hit 300. All there was this thing, uh, Natoma Bay CVE-62. Clicked on it, and up comes this history of a World War II aircraft carrier. And so that was, was the beginning of what the heck is going on here. standing there staring at this picture of this little, it was like an aerial photo of this little aircraft carrier in the water, and we just stood there staring no. at it for a long time. I had no answers. Uh, you know, how could he know this? How could he know a person? How could he know a ship? And what did all this mean? So that was where I really just said, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't know what I'm going to find, but I'm not going to stop looking until I get as many answers as I can get. This was enough to send Bruce on an investigation, doing his own research. Over the next two years, he learned about the men from the Natoma Bay, both living and dead. And James kept giving his parents additional, tantalizing, eerie clues. Well, I kept asking him, do you remember what your name was? Do you remember what your name was? And he always said James. And I thought, well, he's too, he's confused. He, he thinks I'm asking him what his name is. Then James started drawing. That was one of my mission things. The mission thing, you remember that? Yeah. Th that's one of my favorite ones. It's... The same thing over and over, like a movie compressed all into one frame. An air battle, flak, a plane on fire and his signature, James III. The next breakthrough came when Bruce was invited to the Natoma Bay Veterans Reunion. He asked about the names of men killed in battle, and this led him to finally solving the mystery of James III. He called me on the phone and he said, you won't believe this, there's only one guy from Natoma Bay who was killed during the ba battle for Iwo Jima, and his name was it was James M. Houston, Jr. And I said, wait, that would make our James, James III. I was so excited. I'm like, that's it. I'm like, that's him. It's, J it's James M. Houston. His name is James, it's James III. James Houston, Jr., World War II Navy pilot. At age 21, on March 3rd, 1945, his plane was shot down over Chichijima. Now, the skeptical parents were sitting on compelling proof that their little boy really was reincarnated. His parents cautiously made contact with James Houston's only surviving relative, his sister, Anne. At first, she didn't know what to think about the little boy who claimed to be her brother, reincarnated. But then, James asked her for a painting that only one person other than her knew existed. And she sent this January 16th, 2006, it says, Dear James, I do hope that this is the picture you asked for. It is the only one of me done by my mother. I am sorry to be so long sending it to you. These past few weeks have been very busy and hectic. I hope you like it. With my love, Annie. James believed then, as he does now, that it was the dead pilot's soul asking for that picture. I had asked her for a painting that my past mother had done for her and me. This was in her attic for 50 or so years. My parents and she thought it was crazy that I would know about something like this. Anne, too, became a believer. I can understand rational thinking. I'm a pretty rational guy. This is not something rational. <laughs> and I had a struggle with that spiritually. But I came to the conclusion that it's, I now have a three-dimensional belief system instead of two-dimensional. At the University of Virginia's Division of Perceptual Studies, Dr. Jim Tucker has examined James Leininger. Tucker has developed what he calls a strength of case scale for reincarnation, and he gives James a near-perfect score. Um.
average age when they first start speaking is 38 months. So usually two or three years old when it comes out. And some of them will talk about these things anytime, day or night. Sometimes the cases can start with nightmares, the way they did in James Langer's case. Some are intrigued, many are perplexed, um, some are upset. The, you know, some of the Christian parents in the United States are kind of thrown by it. Um, but regardless of their reaction, the children will talk about this for some time, and then usually by the time they get to be five or six, they seem to forget about it and then just go on with their, their current life. After four decades and 2,500 cases, the researchers at the University of Virginia have come to a startling conclusion. Reincarnation is real. The study of reincarnation raises a fundamental question. What is its purpose? The answer comes from past life regression, a discipline of hypnotherapy. Regression is a therapeutic technique used to uncover sources of psychological problems, which are often caused by childhood trauma. Beginning around the 1960s, multiple researchers discovered that when regressed, their patients found the trauma not in their childhood, but in a prior lifetime on Earth. As past life regression evolved, therapists learned how to get information about the time not just on Earth, but between incarnations. A specialization of this research, pre-birth planning, reveals that lifetimes are carefully planned to maximize growth from each incarnation. The purpose of reincarnation, and in fact the purpose of existence itself, is evolution of consciousness. Each incarnation is an opportunity to learn about being human, make better choices, and manifest higher consciousness in daily life. A breakthrough in understanding spiritual evolution came from the research by Dr. David Hawkins, who wrote the book, Power vs. Force. Using kinesiology, Dr. Hawkins calibrated the map of consciousness and created a logarithmic scale for its stages of evolution. The lower states of consciousness resist the flow of life. For example, shame, the lowest state of consciousness on the scale, causes people to commit suicide. From this outright rejection of life, the scale of lower consciousness goes up to pride at 175. A great marker in evolution comes at level 200, where consciousness begins to embrace life. The higher states of consciousness make the human journey one of joy, purpose, and contribution. At the highest level of the scale is enlightenment, which is our eventual goal on the human journey. A key insight by Dr. Hawkins is that on average, most people increase their level of consciousness only by about five points per incarnation. This means that to reach the state of love, at level 500, they would need about a hundred incarnations on our planet. The promise of true spirituality is that it can dramatically accelerate one's evolution. The last piece of the puzzle is about the origin of consciousness. The answer has to be constructed from the latest advances in physics, specifically quantum mechanics. In essence, there is a primal field of consciousness, which splits and becomes individual consciousness. This perspective is called non-duality. Let's watch a short video to explore the concept. What lies at the core of existence? According to advanced physics, and the direct experience of mystics, it is pure, conscious energy. Let's call it unity, which emphasizes that it is the only underlying reality. Since unity is all that exists, paradoxically, it runs into a limitation. The limitation is that it cannot have an experience, because to experience, it would need something outside of itself that would act as the object of experience. 
And so, unity splits itself into an infinite number of individual consciousnesses and becomes infinity. Since unity was pure consciousness, each of its portions is also pure consciousness. But now each is capable of perceiving others. This state, where an infinite number of consciousnesses exist and are aware of their oneness, is the state of connected infinity. There is a knowing that all of existence is an extension of the self. The self can explore consciousness in infinite ways through its interaction with infinity. The state of existence within connected infinity is perfect, but paradoxically, the perfection excludes a unique and invaluable experience, separation. Now you may think, why would any consciousness choose to experience separation? The answer is that there is learning that can only happen in separation. For example, consider power, something we all explore as human beings. In the state of connected infinity, the concept of power cannot exist because all consciousnesses know themselves as one. It is only by perceiving themselves as separate from others that people can cling to power. The way the separation happens is through the mechanism of ego. Here, the word ego is used as a spiritual term referring to the false self. This is different from how the term is used in psychology. The false self is created by identification with what you are not. For example, you may think of yourself as a man or a woman. Identifying with a specific gender creates an entire set of beliefs and restrictions. In reality, you are neither a man nor a woman. You have a body that comes with a gender. But just as you don't become a chair by having a chair, you don't become a body by having a body. The false self hides the true self, just as a blanket wrapped around a light bulb hides the light. For physical incarnation, there is yet another layer the self creates the layer of personality. Personality offers unique characteristics to perceive and interact with existence. For example, an adventurous personality allows people to explore freely. In contrast, a timid personality allows them to be more calculative and cautious. Neither is better than the other because each serves a unique purpose. When there are as many such selves, all hidden under the structures of ego and personality, oblivious to their oneness with each other, they can play the human game. A game of infinite complexity, growth and beauty. To summarize, here are the answers to the three core questions. Each of us is an individuated portion of the source energy. The purpose of the human journey is, is the evolution of our consciousness. Now that we have the principles of spirituality, let's examine the application. Evolved spirituality is about two core practices. Honor yourself and honor others. Honor yourself because you are a portion of the source energy. Here are three ways. First, let go of what does not serve you. Let go of lower emotions such as guilt, shame, and unworthiness. These are toxic burdens you have picked up on your journey, most likely from religious conditioning. They make your journey strenuous. Get rid of them. Let go of toxic relationships and environments. Let go of insecurity that imprisons you in harmful situations. The second way to honor yourself is to have higher aspirations for yourself. 
You bear the light of primal consciousness within. Honor this light by living a life aligned with higher spiritual values rather than the mass programming of consumption and accumulation. Your incarnation is not about being a cog in the economic machinery. The universe is here to support you, but you must take the first step by seeking to live an inspired, fulfilled, and joyous life. The third way to honor yourself is to cultivate your gifts. As a unique expression of the source energy, you have gifts that only you can offer to existence. So use your resources, your time, attention, and money to cultivate these gifts. Let go of meaningless activities, such as social media, news, and passive entertainment. Invest that time in growth, which empowers you to uplift yourself and others. The second core practice is to honor others. From the perspective of non-duality, others are an extension of your own being. We are leaves on the tree of life, all connected and supported by one source of consciousness. Honor others by seeing them as source energy. Each being is on a unique journey to perfection, just like you. When you honor others, you create the foundations of peace and share joy for the collective. Let go of the need to control or manipulate them. Treat them not with judgment, but with compassion. The second way to honor others is through service, which is our highest calling as incarnate beings. When you serve without expecting anything in return, you manifest the highest level of consciousness. As a practical step, find at least one way to serve. Then offer your service as a gift to existence, without expecting anything in return. Your example of service will inspire others and help them on their journey to higher consciousness. So far we have discussed the principles and practices of spirituality. Here are the four tools to raise your consciousness, study, awareness, meditation, and community. The first tool is the study of material aligned with higher consciousness. The bulk of spiritual work is to unlearn the wrong programming, accumulated over decades. Intentional study dismantles limiting and toxic beliefs to make way for a new, empowering belief system. As a practical step, commit to reading for at least 30 minutes daily. The list of recommended resources is available on the Children of Infinity website. The second tool is awareness. Your greatest power as conscious beings is the power to choose, because choice shapes the world. Awareness helps you to see the origin of your choices and make deliberate decisions aligned with your highest purpose rather than programming or the force of habit. The way to cultivate awareness is through inquiry. Examine your choices by asking, is this choice aligned with higher consciousness or lower consciousness? What is the origin of this choice? Am I making this choice from conscious examination or unconscious programming? Does this choice create a better future or does it merely continue the past? The third tool is meditation. Most people have heard about the advantages of meditation but they find it challenging to create a daily meditation practice. The common reason is that they are using outdated forms of meditation. Let's watch a video to learn a better way. To understand meditation, we have to understand ourselves. While we usually perceive ourselves as a body with a mind, the totality of our being is more expansive. To put it succinctly, we are the consciousness that is aware of the body-mind. In a normal state of awareness, our consciousness is occupied with the functions of maintaining the body-mind. These include processing inputs from our senses and internal processes, such as cognition and thinking. During meditation, our consciousness disengages from the external world and turns within. This inward focus allows consciousness to get in touch with its source and be nourished in the process. There are two broad kinds of meditation. The first kind, meditation with the mind, is the most common. In this practice, we focus on an object or a process, such as our breath, 
an image, or a mantra. Maintaining this focus is difficult because our minds incessantly create thoughts. When we lose focus, the goal is to gently bring the attention back and continue. The second kind is meditation with higher energies. Since all of existence is energy, patterns such as our thoughts, habits, and ways of interacting with reality are also energetic in nature. According to yoga philosophy, our behavior arises from deeper patterns called samskaras, meaning seed patterns in Sanskrit. The higher energies originate from higher realms of existence, known as angelic and devic realms. Meditating with them allows them to work at the deeper level of samskaras and transform the core of our being. This kind of meditation does not require dealing with thoughts. All we have to do is to be in a state of receiving and allow the energies to attune us to higher consciousness. The key requirement for this meditation is access to an authentic channel that can transmit higher energies. Human beings with a sufficiently evolved consciousness can act as channels. In later stages of evolution, our own consciousness can serve as the bridge, and we won't require external means. We have created a special meditation called Stairway of Light to accelerate your spiritual growth. This short meditation uses sound as a carrier for higher energies and takes you through the seven stages of human evolution. The seven stages correspond to the seven energy centers in the human body. We recommend using headphones for this meditation. Here is the suggested routine for using this meditation. Do this meditation first thing in the morning for the next 14 days. If mornings are not possible, any time in the day is fine. Drink plenty of water to integrate these energies into your system. If you want to maximize the effect, do the meditation a second time right before sleep. The fourth tool is a community of spiritual, growth-oriented individuals. Studies show that the best way to navigate transformation is through the power of communities. Make sure to be part of a community aligned with the higher consciousness that honors members, not control them. An empowering community will acknowledge your unique gifts and help you nurture them. A journey with like-minded individuals is not only more effortless than traveling alone, it is also a source of profound joy. To help you further on your spiritual journey, Children of Infinity has created a self-paced video course to upgrade your beliefs. The 14-day course breaks down the journey into steps so you can make daily progress and build a solid foundation for your spiritual growth.